So, gentlemen, I have already uh, introduced your names, but however, you know, I could have gone through the whole formal uh, introductions and stuff like that. But you know what? It's better that you introduce yourself, right? So, Andreas, maybe you want to start. Tell us a bit about yourself. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. So, just a short introduction of myself. My name is Andreas Charles Akubiarek. Uh, I'm under the, um, you know, social security organization under the Ministry of Human Resource. And specifically, I'm from the Strategic Initiatives and uh, My Future Jobs Unit. So if you can see our booth there, we have the My Future Jobs uh, portal, the National Employment Portal, and that is where our uh, focus is. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we have also... Uh, why, why did you introduce yourself, actually? <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'm Vijay Subrayan. Okay, salam sejahtera dan salam keluarga Malaysia kepada semua. Uh, I'm actually from uh, Flex Penang. I'm the senior HR manager of Flex Penang. Uh, thank you for, to uh, Perkeso Osokso for inviting me for this uh, forum on this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vijay. And of course, we have Mr. Murthy. So thanks, Kevin. Um, am I audible? Yes, yes, okay, yes. Good. I think. Uh, apa khabar semua? Um, selamat datang dan uh, salam sejahtera. Uh, my name is Murthy and uh, I'm the human resources lead for Micron Memory Malaysia and uh, been in the uh, HR uh, arena for the last uh, 20 years plus. And uh, so I'm really looking forward for this session so that, you know, we can have a very interactive and a, and a, and a good conversation, you know, on the topic that we have chosen today. Thanks, Kevin. All right. So you guys are very experienced in human resource, right? From Pokeso, from Flex. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where the pandemic is something that happened to all of us. All right, the past two years has been very difficult for most of us. So what is the main challenges that you guys and also what you see outside, what people face as well? What is the main challenges you think uh, in this thing? Mr. Murthy, maybe you want to start first? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, yes, um, I would say in the last 18 months, things have changed so drastically that uh, to an extent, that's something that we have never imagined, that we have never anticipated. I think that is a reality. And um, the, the, the kind of change or the transformation that has taken place, um, I would say it has happened in someone's personal life as well as their professional life. You know, that is the kind of uh, transformation that has taken place. Something probably we have not anticipated, something that probably that we have not expected it to happen so fast. One good example is the, the digitization, all right? So the... The way things have uh, uh, evolved and the way things have progressed in the digitization area is something that we have never imagined. I don't think uh, we ever thought that our children will be doing an online schooling um, early of last year, but it did happen. So we did not know and we did not realize that we will be able to do an effective online learning and training uh, or virtual learning and training, but it did happen. And we never, many of us, you know, especially from Generation X, we never thought that virtual working or working from home is going to be equally productive or it's going to be equally effective, like working at a workplace. If you asked us, you know, early of last year, but it did happen. So these are the kind of transformation that has happened. Something that probably we were prepared to go through over the, last, uh, over the next 10 years. But, but it happened in such an accelerated fashion, and so much so that it took us, it, it hit us like a storm, and it took us a lot of maturity and professionalism in order to accommodate, acclimatize, and at the same time, uh, get ourselves used to this storm. So these were some of the challenges that we went through, Kevin. We can, we can talk more later. Maybe we'll give yeah. the panels the opportunity. I mean, you, you did bring up a very good point, the digitalization of, uh, you know, the workforce. And even like, you know, I have a daughter as well. She started going to, you know, online school. I started being the tutor for my daughter, which is very difficult. But like, how, how did this, uh, Mr. Vijay, how did this online working experience, uh, you know, change the scene? Because... Previously, all employers wanted you on the, on the floor. Like, they didn't want you online. They didn't want you to work from home. How did that change now? Thanks, Kevin. Uh, echoing uh, on what Murthy have said, actually. Of course, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way we do things. 
But uh, before I answer you, Kevin, I uh, just want to add on the challenges that we face at the operational or manufacturing. You see, we are, when we are talking about actually manufacturing line, manufacturing industry, we are talking about operators. We are also talking about these blue collars as well as white collars. So the main challenges actually for the uh, operators level. See, for them, their work cannot be digitalized. They still have to come to the office or I will say come to the plant. So these are one of the main challenges. While we can get, we can get our, our office people, those, those who are very much uh, based on uh, office base, to work from home. So uh, actually, Kevin, to uh, ask, answer your question about how well we are equipped and how we manage to accommodate. I will say this is something, a new thing, as what Murthy said, it's a transformation. But that's something that we get used to it. But of course, it needs the commitment, a high discipline from the workforce. But uh, without denying that, it was a challenging even for me uh, in my department actually to get people to be at home working from 8 o'clock up to 5. But actually working from home, Kevin, it's not 8 to 5 anymore. Yeah. You are basically like working for 24 hours in fact because the nature has changed and you really need to support. And the support is not like an office hour support and it goes beyond that as well. Yeah, I don't. I don't I hundred percent agree. It's not. It's not a nine to five anymore because you know even at eight o'clock because you're still at home. Sometimes you don't know when to stop and when to start, right? Now, Andreas, uh, in the in the in the point of Picasso, right? Is it? Do you see the changes happening around? Okay, thank you, uh, Kevin. I think I'm aligned to the sharing that uh, Mr. Muti and uh, PJ have shared. And actually, in terms of uh, the loss of employment, it is, it is very significant. Uh, there's a significant increase in terms of the numbers because in 2019, we have around 40,000 people losing their job. And in 2020, there's, I think, more than 50% increase of the numbers of people losing their job. And a lot of this loss of employment happens in the manufacturing sectors. And because of that, if you, if you look into the transformation of the industry itself, the pandemic catalyzes the adaptation of technology in, in the process itself. And uh, Perkeso, in terms of servicing the nation, in terms of the employment uh, you know, uh, efforts and services, we have extended our services in terms of uh, organizing interview physically. And during the MCO period, we actually have a lot of these virtual interviews. And I think, uh, you know, I believe uh, Flex and also uh, Micron is one of our supportive partners in all of these events that we have. Even extending the services on a weekly basis, allowing employees to meet job seekers without being there physically. You know? So that are some of the transformation that we had in terms of our services. And to assist those job seekers in terms of their, their challenges, I believe that uh, training is always an important part of them. And I think the main challenge that our job seekers face in terms of this retrenchment would be the required skills. You know, the required skills and operational training is still you know, not, not there, and there's a gap in terms of what they can do and what the company and the industry requires. Actually, you bring up a very good point, skills, uh, training, and because you've got to learn new skills, you, you suddenly have to learn how to use a computer, you suddenly have to learn how to, you know, do networking online. So, you know, the question is, is there any, uh, in, is there any skills that has become irrelevant now? Like, you know, in this day and age now, we have new skills to learn. Do we have to forget old skills? Andreas? Okay. Um, when we talk about skills, uh, it's, a, it's a very um, unique situation, you know. Uh, a skill can always be practical, to be utilized in the industry. But the question is, is it in demand? Is it something that the industry requires at this moment? You know, and an industry is very, very dynamic. From one point of time, it will shift from one sector to another sector, maybe in the future it, it focuses more on human interaction. If it looks into this human interaction, yeah? So, skills, on my opinion, is not to be forgotten, but to be emphasized, okay? At this point of time, you can see that a lot of uh, skills that we are, that the industry is adapting is more towards the digitalized skills. And things, uh, I would say manual kind of um, process is now uh, being a bit redundant. For example, data entry system, uh, there are systems uh, in the market that can actually extract data without the you know, presence of uh, human uh, officers to do it. Yeah? And also in terms of uh, you know, accountants and auditors, so people are shifting towards the freelancing uh, sectors. So rather than hiring an accountant to do it for the whole year, I can just 
you know, get someone to do it just during that fiscal year, you know, making sure that audit is being done at, at the time. So I don't have to, you know, uh, pay them as a permanent employee, but taking them into, uh, I would say, uh, more on, on a contract or maybe uh, part-time basis. So uh, those kind of jobs are now more, I would say, um, in risk of being a permanent job because it is, there's a, I would say, possibility of having it as a p temporary solution to, to the companies. So those kind of manual skills and also skills that uh, is, uh, I would say, uh, able to be put into uh, freelancing kind of um, jobs is now at risk. And I, th I believe the, the industry is start to adapt, you know, contracting out services to, to parties. Yeah. I mean, I also have, you know, moved into the freelance business. But yeah, I mean, Mr. Vijay, is it, is it, is it true that some of the skills you know, it's, it, it's become irrelevant. Yeah, Kevin, uh, as what uh, Andreas was sharing, actually, the industry are looking into automation. This is something that's not new, actually, but this pandemic has pushed the industry for automation. So this is where from the, uh, I would say, manual kind of job uh, been uh, explored towards making it more towards like a technical. In case we are talking about our industry, we are no more, uh, I would say, we are, while we continue higher operator, but the number are getting lesser and lesser. We are concentrating more on a, like a technical assistant. So you reduce the number of people, you put on more machines actually. So I will definitely agree that certain things are changing rapidly in the industry, especially towards the automation. And this is what going to, uh, I will say, the future of the manufacturing industry. It will be less human dependent, but uh, more going to be automated. But still, definitely we will be having, I mean, uh, employees who is going to run the machines. So we are looking into other kinds of skills, especially on the technical skills. So you basically robots are taking over our jobs, <laughs> la, right? Uh, and it, it, there is something like sci-fi movies. We see that robots. They, that's a fear that we we have. Like you know, it, it's very, I think the one job that robot cannot take over is comedian, la, Because <laughs> I don't think a robot can make a joke yet. Uh, Mr. Murthy, what what about you? No, I. In fact, you know, I, I completely uh, echo whatever Andreas and Vijay were saying just now. Okay, so I, I would like to also take this opportunity, you know, to thank Pakesu for coming out the, with, the, with the Panjana program, you know, which allows the organizations like us to, to look out for talent or look out for resources, may not have the kind of experience that we may need, but it provides us an opportunity for us to reskill them and also upskill them, you know. So that, that, that's a great opportunity we have had. So if you ask about the skills that has been fading away, um, just like what Vijay said, you know, when, when the entire industry is moving towards smart manufacturing, when we are adopting IR 4.0 quite aggressively, naturally there are certain skills which is routine-based, which is a little bit mundane, which is very much a transactional, will be replaced by AI, automation, and also robotic. You know, that's natural. That's going to happen. And it is happening in a more accelerated fashion now. With that said, what is going to happen to the workforce, right? Are they going to, is their skill is going to be irrelevant? Are they going to be losing jobs? So this has always been one of the dilemma in, uh, in everyone's mind. So, but the reality is when you look back in, in time, Almost all revolution that whatever that took place has created this kind of phobia or paranoia. But, but in reality, it was not true. More jobs were created. More jobs were created, you know, from, from every, every industry. And even with the digitization era that we are talking about now, trust me, there will be more job created, but more job where we will be able to use the human brain. You know, we can use our, our human power in terms of creativity, innovation, creative problem solving, so on and so forth. So in other words, the ability of our workforce is going to be elevated. So we have to start looking at it in a very optimistic fashion. Okay, it's going to be elevated. And the most important thing here is that we need to understand that this is coming and it's coming our way and it's coming very fast. And we need to adopt ourselves. We need to be ready in order to embrace it, adopt it, and at the same time bounce back in a uh, in a very flexible fashion. So that is what we got to be prepared about. To answer another, I mean, just to give you um, uh, uh, my observation, um, you know, when, when we're going through this in the last one and a half years, probably one, one job, you know, I, I, I may not have a complete uh, comprehension about what's happening in the market, but one job 
where I see a lot of people have signed up for the reskilling uh, of opportunity that we have created are the people from the sales force, you know, in the market. People who are in the customer service, people who are in the sales, people in the hospitality industry. For whatever reason, you know, they, 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 um, um, their experience or their expertise uh, is less needed in the market, so therefore they're looking for another opportunity. So this is where we have leveraged uh, quite extensively the opportunity given by Sokso uh, or Pakeso um, by using the Panjana scheme to hire them, reskill them, and bring them into the industry. So this is what really happening in the market. I mean, fair enough. I mean, you, uh, that, that is one thing that we have to move forward with. I mean, yeah, but I mean, what are the new skills? that uh -huh. are you're looking for now. Like, there, there's a lot of job seekers here. There's a lot of people who are looking for jobs, but they don't know what skill to, to hone at this point. Because, yeah, okay, yeah, some people who know computers, yes, that's something. But what about people who work with their hands? What about, you know, people who do manual labor and stuff like that? And, and these skills are very important, but now maybe not so much. What, what are the new skills? Mr. Vijay, why, why don't you start? Yeah, Kevin, uh, for example, we are talking about automation. We are talking about industry 4.0 in order to make sure that i'm still relevant for my company so i want to i mean i want to just give an example as a, i mean person in hr industry so if robot going to take over what's going to happen to me so how am i go going to make sure that i'm still relevant so what kind of skill that i need to look into it for example i will say companies are looking for uh, for, a, for a person beyond what you are doing currently for example as a hr of course we are doing a lot of things but what we can add on actually how we can add on value to the organization by looking into like how we can bring technology into HR. See, people will be thinking HR job are very much operational or transactional or very manual kind of things, or maybe seated on this forum and sharing our ideas. It's actually beyond that, in fact. So this is where I will say the, the skills like how technology can help HR do things better. So this is where the HR leaders need to look into it. So we are talking about mass crowd actually for a fresh graduate. You see, uh, I may touch on the uh, soft skill. What kind of soft skill needed actually at this moment, whether it's going to be a job seeker or existing employee. For example, during the current pandemic, there are a lot of challenges if you ask me. So, one of the things, maybe previously we, we were just concentrated on a day-to-day -day job, but today you need to communicate a lot actually. So why not we, we enhance our communication skills? which will be very much needed in this kind of era where we will need to communicate a lot. So by announcing your communication skills, I believe they can add on more values in their job. Besides that, the, the, I mean, the resilience, and I will say uh, discipline. You see, for example, uh, I, I mean, without putting down anyone, I can tell you in this current era, I've conducted a lot of interview with all my respect to the uh, fresh graduate. So one of the things that I realized actually on the discipline, I even have a problem where people are not attending the interview and not telling us actually they are not attending the interview. And we have even people who do not, do not follow up as well. So these are the soft skills that I will say at this era that company are looking forward in the workforce actually, whether they are going to be a potential employees or even the existing employee as well. So another thing actually, if you ask me, is about the continuous learning. So people must be ready to learn and adapt actually for example, in Flex, we, 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 we launched this uh, new strategy, business strategy called Ways of Working, where it, it includes of respect and value others, uh, learn and adapt, share and uh, uh, collaborate openly, and also honor the commitment. If you look at these four pillars, actually, it says that it's no more a normal kind of organization anymore. While all these things may sound normal, something that we hear all the while, but this is the way moving forward. So we come out with this wow kind of strategy where all these skills are needed. In fact, I'm one of the site champion who is promoting these cultural things or new business strategy at Flags. So Kevin, if you like, I, I could add a little yeah. bit. So I, I totally agree with what Vijay have just said. So, you know, especially, you know, when we see a lot of youngsters here and a lot of fresh graduates, you know, to answer your question a while ago, so what is that particular skill set that we should be looking at? Is there any particular competency or acumen that we need to really um, uh, build ourselves um, towards? So the answer is very simple. There are many. There are many. So we can't list down all of them here. And, and this information is widely available. So this is where you are going to distinguish yourself when you meet your potential employer. 
Okay, so if we are going to be completely dependent on the curriculum, whatever that you have learned during your, in your institutions or your, or your universities or colleges, it is not going to be adequate. It is not going to be sufficient. What have you done more? What have you explored more? What are the additional knowledge that you have acquired, you know, based on your own initiative, based on the assessment and also the, the, the observations that you have done in the marketplace? It's going to create that differentiation when you meet your potential employer. Because, because we, all, we as an employer, we know for a fact, the skill set that you're bringing now today may not be relevant next year, may not be relevant the year after. So what we are going to look at now is your characteristics, your, the, the attitude, and, and the hunger that they have, okay, in order for them to grow and progress in their, in their life. So that is what we look for. And when they come with these attributes and the characteristics, not only by communicating and articulating it well, but also by demonstrating that they have done some work in that area for them to acquire some additional knowledge, it's going to be convincing us that, you know, this is the individual that I'm going to invest in. Okay, so this is probably, you know, what, what the, the future generation should be looking at. I mean, you are a HR expert. I mean, you are, you've been in the HR for 20 years now. So, like, I, I can understand that, I mean, because everyone is at equal level. You want to find the person who is slightly above, who is, stands out among all. Like, you know, is it easy to find that person, though? Oh, yes, yes. You see, I mean, I think uh, we, we will probably briefly touching about this. You know, one thing I like about the young generation nowadays is that, you know, um, I mean, if, if I were to distinguish um, the way how I used to work coming from Generation X, when I was asked to do A, I don't question. I do A, B, C, and D. Okay, but the current generation, you ask them to do A, they will ask you why I need to do A and why I need to do it this way. Why can't I do it the, the other way? And, and I, I love it because, you know, they naturally they have this curiosity. Naturally, they ask the questions why. You know, so this is where innovation starts. This is where creativity starts. So it has to be harnessed. So if you, to answer your question, what is that that, that we look for is this creativity and also this curiosity. So that is going to set them apart and which is already naturally available in them, you know. So only thing you need to just harness it. And you don't just ask question, you must also look for the answer. Okay, so probably, you know, that is, that is what I would like to share. That, you know, the natural tendency of asking question and being curious is already there. It has to be harnessed. It has to be enhanced, and they need to own, not only asking questions, they must also make an effort in order to look for the answer. Yes. Kevin, maybe, don't uh, just ask the question and then... I, I, I may add on uh, one thing on top of what Murthy has said, actually. I always tell my candidate, potential candidate, I do not hire someone for the knowledge alone or the experience alone, because that's a done deal. You cannot come in for an interview uh, without any knowledge or experience. Beside the fresh graduate, this is something, a different case. Always say that I hire for the attitude. For me, these are a lot of things that is lacking actually in current generation, which I'm seeing on attitude. So I always say I'm okay, I'm okay to hire someone with a zero knowledge, but with a good attitude. Because I can't be teaching attitude. Attitude is something in your DNA actually. But I can be teaching you skills, I can teach you a knowledge. In fact, currently I'm hiring for my own department. If anyone interested actually in HR line, with the right attitude, I will go for them. So to answer your question, is it easy? It can be easy, it can be tough actually. Because during interviews, sometimes you can't ascertain certain things, such an attitude. So this is a bit difficult. So if you ask me, my, my, my personal advice, okay, that is something that employer currently looking forward. Because for an organization to succeed, a positive attitude, a right mental attitude is very, very essential. Because all this knowledge, all these skills, it's a done deal. If you ask me, by default, it should be there. No, I mean, that's true. I mean, you can read about riding a bike, but until you have the attitude to want to ride the bike, you're never going to go anywhere. Uh, Andreas, I'm sorry you've been, you've been uh, sidelined for a while, but what, in the sense of Pocasso, what, what do you think about this? Okay, um, maybe just to share um, my, my first response, which, which is in terms of the skills. Uh, since 2019, we have collected more than two point. 7 million vacancies throughout the nation. And we found out that it's aligned to what uh, Muti and also Uji were saying, you know. Uh, a lot of these skills are skills that requires communication. It's, it's very, very important. 
And um, if, if we look into the, the trend of the skills, it is more towards the digitalized kind of skills, IoT, you know, uh, inter Internet of Things, yeah? And then uh, big data. And because of this young generation, they are looking into the, how do we analyze data from social media and those kind of, uh, you know, platforms. So we are looking more towards digitalization. And because of that, our young workforce is actually adaptable to the changes, you know? Uh, but I like the point that Vijay and Muti were saying, um, you know, in terms of the attitude. It is, it is very, very relevant because uh, in 2020 which, uh, and 2029, we have organized more than 10,000 open interviews throughout the country. And the main reason for a job seeker to be hired is the attitude, you know, the attitude to learn, the attitude to be trained. That's very, very important. Uh, you know, job seekers, whenever they, they, they attend our interview, we'll have employability programs. And that's the main idea that we will share to them is to be open to the opportunities and open to the training programs that is available. Because I believe in the industry, there's no company that would, uh, you know, expect a job seekers to go into the company knowing to do every single thing. They will be training provided for the job seekers. So you have to be open. It's about the attitude, you know. So I, I believe that it's aligned to what we understand. The attitude is very important. And again, I like to emphasize what Vijay was saying, you know, you hire for attitude, you train for skills. I, I think that perfectly sums up, you know, what, what is the hiring process and interview process is about. Yeah. I mean, you bring me to this uh, a very interesting point. We've been talking about what employers want from employees, what we are looking for, what they need to do. But what about the employers? I mean, Mr. Burti, what, what, what are the employers doing to increase the skills of the current workers or even the new workers that you're getting? No, it, it, is, it is basically the bread and butter of every organization. In order to, in order to provide the relevant training, uh, knowledge, as well as uh, the development opportunity for every uh, individuals that we bring into the organization, because the success of every individual, it's going, to, it's going to be reflected in the success of the organization. So any organization uh, in the current era, if they are overlooking the, the training and the development part, or they are overlooking the, the need for reskilling and upskilling, will be completely, um, um, will be out of the game. All right, so this is the necessity. Because you know, we, we all talk about the WUKA world now, right? So in this WUKA world, the change is happening uh, so fast and so frequently. And as an organization, if you want to stay relevant, as an organization, if you want to be at the top of your game, so this particular element of training and development has to be an ongoing one. So to answer your question, what the organization doing? If you ask any organizations, you know, whoever put up the exhibition here, they will testify to this that, you know, they have a very robust development program. But in the current era, right, so there are certain areas probably that as an organization that we should be looking at, which is going to be your competitive advantage or your, your, your differentiator. Namely, you see, when, when a good example, when everyone started, we have a large portion of the population now uh, working remotely, right? When, when people work remotely, it is completely a brand new experience to many, okay, including myself. So this is where you're going to work with your kids uh, doing your online schooling next to you, you know, side by side. Your wife, your spouse is having uh, another call, you know, with her employer in the other part, in the other side of the room. And, and you have to run the errands of the house and you got to have an elderly care probably at home. With all these dynamics, right, for you to focus, for you to be effective and for you to be productive, it's going to be extremely challenging. Okay, so, so you as a manager or a supervisor, how are you engaging with your team? How are you going to con constantly keep your team motivated? How are you going to build relationship? How are you going to be more caring towards their well-being and wellness? It is going to be a differentiator. And, and this is a skill, this is a skill uh, which we have spoken about for a very long time, but there has not been, uh, there has not been too much of emphasis because we as a manager or supervisor, we have always been trained in order to lead the organization towards peak performance. But now we have, to, we have to shift left and start looking at how is your well-being? How are things doing at home? You know? 
So, uh, I mean, what, what kind of emotional support that they need? What kind of psychological support that they need? So this is an area that we have to start focusing on. And there's no, there's no second thought about this because this is going to be uh, a differentiator in terms of uh, allowing an organization to attract and retain good talent to the organization. Because the, the, the norm has changed, okay, the, the, under the new norm. And trust me, the new norm is going to outlive the pandemic. And uh, we, we, don't, we don't expect our life to be the way how it used to be two years ago, even after the pandemic is over. And it's not going to be there anymore. So our, the new norm is going to outlive the pandemic for sure. So in that kind of circumstances, for you to be competitive, so we need to adopt all these additional uh, needs that the human beings uh, have to go through in a workplace in a very fast and in a very effective fashion. So these are some of the things, like for example, wellness and well-being is becoming the talk of the town now in almost every organization because we know there's a need for it. But we can talk about it, but how many people can really, really live it, right? Because, you know, we have not been trained in that area. Okay, so these are the areas that probably that we have to look at as an organization, apart from, you know, providing the learning, training, and the development which the job needs. And these are the additional uh, features or the elements that we have to put in place in order to make sure that the organization is inclusive, the organization is effective, the organization is productive. Kevin, uh, can yes. I add something, Kevin? Sure, sure. Talking about this uh, wellness, actually, what we did, in fact, during the pandemic, we even provide uh, free chairs and free tables for employees, actually, to continue work from home. So we know that, I mean, some, some may do not have the... Uh, it's not about the cost, actually. May, may, they may do not... Uh, spend on that that area. So the company decided actually to give away to all those office workers who need to work from home. Coming back uh, in terms of what the employer doing in ensure that our workforce have the right skills and talent actually. In fact, in, at Flex, we are providing a free education to everyone from operator up to even a senior director or even the GM would like to learn further, they can go. In fact, we have those courses like uh, professional certificate in data analytics, machine learning, professional certificate in logistics, professional certificate at a human resources uh, officer level, or even we have a degree program, master program, only that PhD is not started yet. So what I'm trying to say actually, company like Flex or even I will say Micron, we do emphasize a lot on the learning. In fact, at Flex, as I say, no bonding, eh? you don't need to be bonded actually, it's a free. No need to repay. Unless you resign, then it's a different terms and condition. As long as you are employed by the company, it's free of charge. So we invest a lot of money. In fact, every year, easily we are training close to 1,000 people from certificate, diploma, degree up to master. So this is another thing that company are investing on top of hiring and paying the people accordingly, in fact, Kevin. I mean, that's, that's very... Is it Andreas, what about uh, you? Okay, thank you, Kevin. I, I would like to add, I think um, that's a very good point, especially when we talk about the mental health you know, of, of uh, employees working from home. And, and I think this is a very new thing, and we don't really discuss about mental health uh, at this you know, uh, rate before. I know? was going to ask you about mental health. Yeah, so exactly. uh, given that um, so, so we are handling a few training grants, uh, I think through hiring incentives, yeah? So whenever employer hires a job seeker, uh, they, they have the capacity to send them for training. And uh, we have also uh, other agencies under the Ministry of Human Resource, such as uh, HRD Corp, okay, uh, providing grants for employers to send their employees, the currently working employees, to uh, training programs. And we have seen the trend of employers sending them to acquire uh, new uh, skills and also, um, I would say, special, um, specialized uh, officers in mental health sector especially. So they send their officers to be trained consultants, trained uh, mental health uh, you know, advisors in, in the company to help employees that is uh, having those pressure and stress working from home. So there are, I would say, a lot of incentives by the government through training grants, hiring incentives, and also you know, uh, in certain companies, they have this uh, funding where they can actually train their employees to make the working uh, place a better Please, you know, in terms of uh, our facilities and also the uh, experts in the company to assist them in, in that uh, sense. Okay, okay. Win. yeah, just, yeah, just to ahead. add on. So, like, like at Micron, you know, the the emphasis towards the mental health 
is uh, so strong that so much so in the last one year, we have hired a dedicated person, two people, one for wellness, the other one for well-being, just to study uh, and, and conduct a due diligence to identify among the 4,000 employees that we have, what are the kind of support that they need, and secondly, an on-site counsellor to whom that they can engage. But on top of that, um, the organization globally have also subscribed to employee assistance program, whereby uh, um, the, this, this, um, the guided resources will be available for all the employees and their family members in the event they need any kind of emotional support or psychological support. But these are all a bunch of professionals and it is for free. So they can just dial into the hotline, make an appointment. You know, they have about eight to ten appointments they can make throughout the year for the employee plus their, their, uh, their family members. On, on any topics, it could be like, you know, financial well-being, it could be like social well-being, it could be like an emotional thing they're going through, any supports for that matter. So these are the things that the organization have prepared, taking into consideration, uh, weighing the, the, the importance of well-being, okay, and also wellness for, for employees at the moment. Okay, okay, Micron and Flex, you all have been doing quite a lot, uh, which is nice. Mental health is something that is very taboo to begin with, right? I mean, like, you all have... You all have counsellors and you're this thing and helping, you know, with the mental health and everything. But how has the employees reacted to this? How, how, how do they take, because it's very taboo. Like, you know, like my aunties and uncles, if they, if they see a counsellor, means they gilali. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's the perception. Yeah. Right? They, they, they need to go to Tanjung Rambutan. That, that is the taboo. But how has your employees, you know, taken this into... No, and the answer is yes, you're absolutely right. It took, it took a lot of education and awareness, okay, in order for them to feel that it is absolutely fine and it is okay to seek professional help, okay, because you, you, you're right. And, and, and it goes by generation also, though, you know, when you talk about baby boomers and generation X, it's like, you know, you're, I mean, are you saying that, you know, I need, I need, a, I need a psychiatrist, you know, is that what you're saying? So that, that's a, it's a general thing that, that uh, they have. But, but the awareness is, uh, uh, people are gaining the awareness that they know, just like if I'm physically, if those days, when you're physically fit, you don't want to go for the doctor. You know, like my father, he doesn't want to go for the doctor immediately. He will find his own um, uh, remedies in order to fix himself. But then came the later generation, so we have a problem, we don't think twice, we walk into a doctor. Okay, but now, the same thing when it comes to mental, mental health. Probably we are a little bit resistant, but, but the awareness is, uh, is there now. And secondly, the, the, the younger generation, they, they, they really understand the need. You know, they, they are making a decision. Yes, you know, I need a professional help and they go for the professional help. Okay, so uh, you're absolutely right. It is not something, and in fact, the, in, the, in our culture in Asia, it is not that embraced yet compared to the Western culture. But, but the awareness is, uh, is, uh, is kicking yeah. in. I will agree, Kevin, on that actually. Definitely, even I myself, we, we believe that we should solve our own problem, actually. Okay? That's, that's something that uh, in our generation. But I uh, totally agree with Murthy that, in fact, even at FLAX, we have full-time counsellor. This we have started somewhere in 2016, in fact, way before all this pandemic started. We believe that uh, mental wellness is a big area, an important area. But again, how we approach, that is what we decided, actually, on top of our own psychologists, we created these groups called Employee Resources Group. So this group comprised of a lot of area. In fact, uh, this was uh, corporate driven and uh, all the 30 sites in our worldwide actually, we are operating easily in 30 countries, uh, flags actually. And uh, we created a lot of Employee Resources Group. So the employee can choose actually to which group they want to join. For example, we have uh, ERG group under person with disabilities. We, are, we have ERG group under women in flags, women in tech. We have even uh, ERG group for sustainability activities, learning and development. So what, what we, we, we are creating actually for the employee, a platform for them to join a group and get socialized themselves, get involved in more engagement activity. For example, under the PWD ERG group, that doesn't uh, restrict it to those persons with disabilities only, but also for everyone to contribute. In fact, at Flex, currently we have 150 PWD employees. We are one of the largest employers in Malaysia. And in fact, we are continuing continue hiring 
more PWDs. So this is another platform, Kevin, I would like to share, where employee can, can go beyond, beyond. So what I'm trying to say, Flex are creating an opportunity for them to join this kind of group so that you can take away the, the resistance and the shyness away from them. Kevin, I would like to add a yes. little bit on uh, some of the sharing from uh, the other panels. Um, when we talk about mental health at this moment, I, I believe the normalization of mental health is, de is there here in this generation. Uh, just a simple example, uh, a student in, in university uh, saying that I have a lot of Simon, I'm depressed. So people start to normalize. So it's, it's no longer a, a very, taboo. I would say, hard kind of taboo. Yeah. And also, from, coming from SOXO as the social security organization, handling people uh, losing their jobs, and also people who is involved in accidents and also having a lot of issues that makes them a PWD, uh, we have to understand that when we talk about mental illness or mental health, uh, you know, it's, it's a spectrum. You know? A person can have depression, and, but it depends how severe it is. You know, we have to start embracing that there's, there is a spectrum in terms of that mental illness. Everybody has that uh, depression or maybe you know, uh, anxiety, but to what level? We have to accept them and tell themselves that I can still operate in the society with the right coordination and facilitation like what you know, uh, Micron and also Flex is doing. So I think that's, that's something we have to start adapting and move towards. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, we, we've come to almost the end of uh, this panel. And thank you so much for joining us because you, you guys have given a lot of insight. But now what I want to ask is, you know, can you share your experiences with uh, this new generation, these new hires that you have, you know, during the pandemic, after the pandemic, and what's going on? What, 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 what are your hopes and, you know, uh, requirements or, you know, anything like that you want to share with what has happened over the, over the past two years? Mr. Murthy, you can Yeah, say. yeah, maybe I can go first. Um, honestly, uh, like at Micron, so we have made a decision that, uh, you know, so we have a reason for making this decision. Um, so we wanted to make sure that for every, every year, uh, not less than 60 to 65 percent of our new hires uh, under the professional category have to be new college graduates. New college graduates meaning fresh from the institutions. And why are we doing that? Because um, like the, the, the region where we are currently operating, it's a very highly competitive market. And, um, and, and you know, the resources are very, it's a, it's a finite resource that you have there. And if you only focus on experienced people, and you're going to start pinching against each other because, you know, the supply into the market, uh, into the ecosystem is not as much as the, the demand, right? So we have strategically opted to move towards new college graduates uh, for engineering and professionals as well as technicians as well as operators, right? And uh, so having said that, 70 to 80 percent of the organization that uh, of uh, the people that I have in my organization today are below the age of 30. All right, so that's uh, how young the organization. So, so I, I have done enough observation and also uh, worked very closely with this young generation. And there are a few observations. Okay, firstly, you know, I mean, uh, they have the energy. And just like what I mentioned, they're very curious. They want to get things done fast. And, uh, and they want flexibility. They want to be trusted. And they want to be empowered. And they want to learn from the, from the senior guys, you know, they like to be mentored and also coached. And these are all beautiful attributes, you know, when people come and tell me, oh, the new generations have like this, the new generations have like that, you know, my answer is only one thing. Hey guys, look here, you have to learn to live in their world. Because, you know, they are going to, they are the future workforce. And this is the way how they operate, okay, and this is the way how things are going to be. And we are going to learn we have to learn to live in their world, okay? So this is the kind of transformation that we go through at our organization, the leadership level, that you don't try to transform them. You don't go and tell that, hey, this is the way I used to do things 20 years ago. This is the way how I used to do things the last 15 years ago. It's not going to sell anymore. You try telling that to your kids, you know, they're going to laugh at you, okay? So, and he or she is going to tell that, hey, that's, that's your problem, you know, that's not the way uh, how, how you expect me to work, right? So, and your old days, you know, sad stories is not going to inspire them anymore. Okay, so the reality is this is the way they are. And we got to, and if we want to attract them, if we want to retain them, and we want to leverage on them, 
We've got to learn to live in their world. Okay, that's the reality. But my only advice is, one particular aspect of the thought process of this younger generation is the entitlement mindset. Okay, because, you know, I probably the way we were brought up, whatever we want, parents give. You know, whatever we want, you know, we will get. It is not the same anymore outside there in reality when come to the working life, you know. So we can't have that entitlement mind mindset all the time. We must know the importance of merits. We must know the importance of uh, earning it, okay? So this is the mindset change that probably all the youngsters have to look at, have to internalize and have to understand so that they can excel well at their workplace. But all the other attributes or whatever that they carry, you see, talking about virtual, virtual working, right? This generation have been talking about that for the last three, four years, right? But, but, but the organization have never really, you know, Listen to them, but now you have no choice, right? So, so that's the reality. So, talking about adaptation, adaptation to this new norm, they're going to do do extremely well in this new norm if only they've been guided and coached. And we know we have to approach them not in the eyes of transforming them to work like us, but us trying to get into their head and make them work the way how they want to work, so that they can be productive and effective. Right. So, like basically. We have to learn how to use TikTok, lah. <laughs> yeah. Mister Vijay. Yeah, while well, uh, fully echo with uh, what Murthy has said, but I think I will have few advice actually for a fresh graduate, especially on the time management. Actually, if you if you are at the college or university, if you miss one class, actually, you can always go for another class or go for tutor. But it's not same once you join the workforce. Okay, for me, I'm uh, almost all the company. While we are promoting flexibility. One thing that you can be sure that all the organization allows certain degree of flexibility. That's how the organization works. In fact, if you are talking about pandemic time, there are a lot of flexibility being given. But time management is something very, very important. Why? We need to get things done within the time frame given. Another thing I will say on the critical thinking. This is something that maybe the university and the colleges can look into it. How to create a fresh graduate with a critical thinking. Because this is another skill that very much needed in our organization nowadays. Another one, I will say definitely communication or public speaking. You see, it's about not only about work, work, work. How you present yourself actually. How you present your case point. How you present to the management. How things can be done better. On top of that, I will say the fresh graduate also know how to carry out research. This is something maybe you have done it in your uh, in UC days. But this is something again you need to do. I will say you need to continuously get into it, into doing a research or getting very analytical. So another one actually working in a team. Okay, nowadays unlike those days, those days we get involved in all kind of activities at kampong level. Our generation, okay, we our team work started while we are kids actually. Okay, we get together with our neighbors. Okay, we get together with our friends. We go and do many many things. Today people only playing. Mobile legend, okay? That's something very, very common. So we don't see the teamwork there actually. So this is another area. See, when we are talking about organization, organization will never exist without a team. While all the leaders, while all the leaders will lead us through the excellency of the organization, but again, the teamwork will be another top area. Hi. Andreas, what about yeah. you? Maybe, maybe just to add a little bit. I, I believe uh, Muti and also Vijay, covered a lot, uh, you know, of the, uh, I would say, uh, attributes that is important in terms of employment. And maybe just to share, in terms of the placement that we had this year, more than 150,000 people were placed, which is between the age of 20 to 29. So it's totally aligned to what um, we were saying earlier. But when we talk about what are the attributes that is important for placement, if I, I believe communication is there, you know, uh, analytical thinking, and then the attitude, good attitude is there. Uh, another important thing that our graduates should be also looking into is the ability to pay attention to details. Because I, I believe at this moment, everything is being simplified and the average attention span of our generation is just six seconds. That, that's very, very alarming, you know. So we have to start being able to pay attention to things and observe things better. Because the different company would have different cultures, different ways of doing things, and it is not a fix. Uh, you know, uh, process in every company. So we have to be very adaptable to these changes. Maybe previously I was in sales and when I go to welfare, it's a different way of selling things. But there's still, there's, there's this 
uh, same skill being utilized in different industry. So I think we have to be able to be focused and to understand what are the difference between the cultures of the company. And that requires us to have a more, I would say, um, uh, concentrated uh, focus in terms of where we are working. So I believe that's very important for our graduates because you need to adapt to the company. It's very hard for the company to adapt to you unless you are, you are a very progressive kind of company. But I believe, I believe that the culture is there and it will be there to stay unless there's a transformation, a big transformation uh, happening to the company. So we need to learn how to adapt and to observe the culture and be a part of the culture and to improve. So. All right, thank you guys. Now, uh, what I want to do is I want to open the floor to you guys to ask them anything you want. Like, is there any questions from the floor? Please, don't be shy. Jangan malu-malu. Tanya je. Apa-apa you nak tanya, tanya je. Usually, this is the part where nobody, nobody wants to ask it. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, everybody's scared. Oh, we do? Okay. Of course. <laughs> Okay, this is Rick because I'm part of a case. So yes, of course. <laughs> Mr. Paul, come. Please, ask your question. Yeah, uh, uh, and Andy, you can jump in as well. But for VJ Moti, thank you. You all have really done a lot and I'm glad you all uh, got whatever awards you received. Well deserved. Uh, but I have a specific question in relation to something, a conversation I had on Monday with a training provider that provides online training programs. They, a government agency signed up language uh, uh, agency for a series of uh, programs they wanted in English. So they selected their employees and it was all online and they found that there was only 20% participation and when they followed up, the guy said we are not interested in learning English and they were selected because they have a, a language deficiency in that area. I mean weak in communication skills as you mentioned but specifically the English. So two questions. One is how important is communication in English for the generations and since your workforce is largely below 30. And two, uh, if it's important, why would this happen, no? that guys who are selected to attend online training, just 20% of them only participated, the rest just didn't bother and they said, we are not interested. I, I was shocked. So could I have your perspective, please? Yeah, so yeah, <clears throat> yeah that, that's interesting. So when, when we talk about the need uh, for someone to be pro-efficient uh, in English and at the current era is something that um, that we, we don't have to convince anybody. You know, it's the reality because you know why? Um, I don't think any organization is going to be confined to the region where they are currently operating. Somehow or other, you're going to be expanding your scope because that is how we're going to uh, sustain and also grow. So we have to reach out to the region and also globally. Okay, so be it a small company and a, a, a local based company, or even if it is a multinational. So the workforce that, that we bring into the organization um, that naturally have to have this acumen or the ability for them to communicate in local language as well as in English. You know, that's the reality. So the, coming to the question, why, why knowing this, why you still have people who have less inclination in order to sign up for this language, this goes back to my earlier point, the adaptability, the awareness and also the adaptability. Because when we spoke a lot about skills, right? Hey, they, what are the new skills that we are talking about? You know, uh, and, and how, how, um, how advanced the, uh, the employees have to be in terms of acquiring these new skills, how sensitive they got to be in terms of understanding what are the new skills that is available in the market for them to stay relevant. But one particular skill or the ability is about communication. When we talk about communication, it's not only about articulating it, it's not about presenting yourself, it's not only about you know, connecting and conveying the message. Yes, it is all correct, but in the language that your audience should be able to understand, right? So if you're talking about local audience all the time, yes, you know, understanding and be, be proficient with the local language is absolutely good. But if your audience are going to be beyond this region, the audience are going to be from the, from the regional perspective and global perspective. And for you to really step up in terms of your career and also in terms of your, your connection uh, within the network, your ability to converse in English is absolutely necessary. So to answer your question, sir, uh, it is an awareness that we have to create, you know, that has to create, that has to come from the individual 
at the same time you know uh, the culture the organization is going to be driving okay in terms of somebody to take up skill and language is definitely one of them yep thanks maybe i would like to add a little bit sure. on mr yeah. muti's um, explanation i think it is very important also to to be adaptable in terms of language what, like what um, mr muti mentioned and also um, a very important point for our uh, fresh grad uh, our graduates and also our people is to have the uh, culture of not being so malu-malu you know when we talk about english there's always this stigma you know whenever somebody speaks in english they say wow acha acha london i believe you know uh, so uh, those those kind of thing that that kind of mentality should be uh, uh, you know uh, removed from our ge new generations because we are we are living in a world where we need to adapt to the changes as fast as we can and if english is the new you know uh, lingua franca i believe yeah i believe it, it is already then we have to start adapting to it then we will start being competitive in the market and then to be able to compete with other graduates so i believe the key take is to make sure that this generation this young graduates is you know up to the challenge and we have to be courageous to the right things for example trying a new language it's okay to fail but you learn from your failures so i think just to add a little bit on no that. i think uh, in my personal opinion is that's very personal mm. it's absolutely fine for you to learn as many languages as possible right oh. and and uh, now I, i enroll my both my kids in in japanese and mandarin okay on in india in their school because uh, you know they like it and they have the ability to pick up the language you know if you have the ability and the capability to pick up a language why not right so so because you know the the world is getting smaller and smaller so meaning you're going to be connected to the world okay and and uh, you know the technology and uh, and whatever platform that is available now is connecting the world and at the same time you know it's making it so small and so therefore your ten your tendency and uh, the the probability of you connecting with somebody who speaks a different language who's coming from a different culture it is going to be part of life okay and your your ability to adapt to them and the, your ability to connect with them and to see things in a very inclusive fashion it's going to be the new norm you know whether we like it or not there is a kind of mindset that there is a kind of perspective that we should have in order for us to operate in the global, global platform i i'm just going to open the floor for one more question is there any other questions that uh, sure there you go <laughs> uh hi good morning uh dear panels okay so uh my quick question uh, i am a fresh grad uh, but then i have some experience doing internship as well so during my internship there was one situation where my bosses were uh when we had a discussion my bosses were expecting more from me but in my opinion like my humble opinion i felt that i was doing much better than all my other colleagues uh, i mean everyone will have that right but sometimes i have this discussion with uh, another colleagues and all that sometimes they would also back me up they say uh, yeah you are doing more than what you are supposed to do but still if the boss expects you expects you to do more i don't know what to say lah so uh when this kind of situation it's good to expect more from someone that that i can understand but then i don't know how much i must do to satisfy my bosses so yeah i cannot find that balance lah i mean i might sound show off uh but uh yeah i just don't know how to uh, please my boss uh that's my question lah what should i do and all that thank you very much uh okay i didn't get your name actually uh sorry sir my name is melvin melvin yeah melvin eh Melvin uh, I think a uh, internship is quite common in all the companies law first of all I think uh, this is go back to the organization the organization first of all must understand the the definition of internship if you ask me I think in terms of flags and micron I think we know what to expect from the organi I mean from the intern so first of all the interns are coming for industrial training so if you ask me we we clearly knows that there will be maybe some some isolated cases where the organization expect more or try to use this intern as their maybe a additional workforce while while i do agree that as an intern uh, after all we call it a industrial trainee you see industrial trainee you should expose to what you are going to face in future as a confirm employee within within the organization or beyond any other organization but in terms of expectation i think this is something to be discussed this is should be discussed from the day one with the organization that we are going to take up the industrial training so while while it unfortunate if someone want to use the industrial trainee as their workforce we are very clear actually 
both Micron and Flags, we are, we are subscribed to Responsible Business Organization, RBA actually, Alliance in fact. So we are very clear that uh, internship should be an intern who come for a training purpose to get an uh, industrial training experience. So in terms of just answer your question, how to satisfy the bosses who expect more? I think it's between the expectation and between the reality. The reality is you are an industrial trainee who is under internship, who are here to learn things, to expose to the real world of working life. So I think with that, things can be sorted out. Maybe Murthy have something to say. Yeah, so it's not an answer, but it's just sharing of an experience. I remember asking a question like this 25 year ago, years ago when I first started my job, but not as an intern, but as a, as a fresh graduate, you know, I joined as a, as, a, uh, as a training exec in one of the companies. And I did ask this question because I was a training exec and I was training a bunch of salespeople. And uh, it's not so much about the volume of work, but more on the compensation perspective, right? So I asked, the guys who I'm training, you know, they're earning more than me, right? So, so is this fair? Um, so, and um, you know, probably in the same tone of the question that you have just asked us, like for example, uh, my peers are all probably doing the same work, but, but the expectation that the boss have on me is more. He wants me to do more. And what will actually satisfy him, right? What is the threshold? So that's the question that you're asking. So I, I will not forget the answer that, that my, my supervisor or the mentor at that point of time, uh, he is an Australian gentleman, so he told me one thing. He said, very simple, Murthy, number one, if you keep comparing yourself with others, all right, so you'll never be satisfied. But, because at any stage in your life, there will always be somebody else doing more better than you. So always compete between what you are capable of and what you are currently doing, number one. Number two, and this is something that has been my mantra throughout my life, is that, is it? Okay, when you studied for four years, you know, who really paid your tuition fees? He said, I paid my tuition fees. So meaning you paid to learn, right? Yes. He said, why don't you tell yourself now, you are getting paid to learn. So meaning at the end of every month, the company is paying you to learn. The moment you start looking at things from that perspective, every experience, every challenge, every work, every opportunity that you are going through at your workplace, look at it as a learning opportunity. Then you are getting paid to learn at the end of the month. So your entire paradigm will shift. The way how you look at workload is going to be different. The way how you're going to look at crisis at your workplace is going to be different. The way how you are, you, the, the, the additional task that is given to you is going to be different. It's completely in our mindset. All right. So, so that is something that I have learned 25 years ago. I have used it until today. And I would say that that has really helped me in my career in many ways. Okay. It's all about how you look at uh, your workplace, how you look at work and how you look at responsibility given to you. Okay. If we, if we tell ourselves, you know, uh, well, my peer is earning the same amount of money. I'm doing more work than him. So there's no end to this, right? Okay, and, and all of us, we go through this kind of dilemma in our mind, you know, all the time. Just a simple paradigm shift, you know, will be able to set you on the right path. You, you will end up learning more, you will end up growing fast, you will end up uh, climbing the ladder a lot better than many other people in the organization. All right, hope, hope it helps. Thank you. All right, so thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us in this panel today. And uh, we will end this session now. We already spoke to the employers. After this coming up, we will be speaking instead to the graduates and, uh, you know, how they face this new uh, pandemic and this new normal in so many ways. Uh, but for now, thank you very much. Let's, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.